Today, the Arctic looks very different than it used to 50 years ago, especially in terms of the Arctic Ocean. And, you know, even compared to sea ice conditions that we saw in the late 1980s, today we have an Arctic Ocean with large amounts of open water all along the both Eurasian and the North American sectors in the summertime. And where we used to have this perennial ice that stuck around year round, now we see that, you know, we're about half the amount of sea ice that we had just 40, 50 years ago. And large parts of the Arctic Ocean are now completely ice free. But, you know, one thing to keep in mind, while the summer sea ice minimum receives a lot of attention in the media, sea ice loss is not limited to summer. And this may seem like a bit of a complicated graphic, but it really just shows on the x-axis the year and on the y-axis the month. And then each color represents uh, how far the monthly sea ice extent in that particular year or month deviates from average conditions that were computed from 1981 to 2010. And what this graph really highlights is that since the mid 2000s, every month shows below average ice conditions relative to the 30 year climatology. And it also highlights that actually the largest departures from average conditions that we've been seeing have not just occurred in September of 2012, which was quite anomalous, but actually this October of 2020, we had the largest departure from average conditions that we've ever recorded. And even May and November of 2016 were actually larger departures that we saw in 2012. And because ice conditions were so unusual this year, especially with early meltdown in the Laptev Sea, the northern sea route along the Russian coast was open until the end of October. And according to the Federal Agency for Maritime and River Transport, the first 10 months of 2020 saw an increase in transit shipping between Asia and Europe of 83% compared to last year. So these are big changes that are happening, especially along the Eurasian sector, but also in the North American sector. While there is a lot of year-to-year -year variability in the sea ice cover, you know, we're not really good at predicting, well, are we going to have a new record low from one year to the next? We do know that the long-term decline is very strongly linked to how much to our atmosphere. In our 2016 study, we defined the drivers for this relationship and established that for every metric ton of CO2 that we add to the atmosphere, we melt another three square meters of sea ice. And this study really allowed us to put some concrete numbers on how much more CO2 we can add to the atmosphere before we will start seeing ice-free conditions. At just an additional 700 gigatons of carbon, we will drop below 1 million square kilometers of sea ice in September, which is often a threshold that scientists use to define when essentially most of the Arctic Ocean becomes ice-free. And at our current emission rates of about 35 to 40 gigatons of carbon each year, this transition will likely happen before the middle of the century. Similarly, because global warming is related to increased atmospheric CO2, this linear relationship then also holds for temperature. And by doing so, we can find that even at a 1.5 degree target of warming above pre-industrial, there's already the possibility for some Septembers to show ice-free conditions occasionally, but that by reaching about 1.7 degrees, we'll get permanently ice-free Septembers. But, you know, it doesn't just stop there. The number of months that an ice-free conditions will occur will also increase then with additional warming such that if we reach a three degree amount of warming above pre-industrial levels, we'll have about five months of essentially ice-free conditions in the Arctic. I mean, this is a huge climate shift that really hasn't happened in tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. Finally, you know, the above results were based on observations, but we can also look, of course, in our climate model simulations and looking at um, similar evolutions that were shown in the last slide with the red um, graphs or lines showing where things would be if we just did business as usual compared to if we start to do some really drastic reductions in our CO2 emissions. And these are just showing the results um, from the latest round of climate model simulations that go into the next IPCC report for both September and March, showing both the potential trajectories under these different greenhouse gas scenarios in terms of ice area on the left and ice volume on the right, which integrates then also the thickness of the sea ice. And we can see that at the moment, regardless of which emission scenario we follow, ice-free Septembers are likely by the middle of the century. If you just look at the spread from the different emission scenarios, they really overlap. And so that we can see by 2040, 2050, all of these emission scenarios are gonna indicate the potential for ice-free Septembers to already occur. But if we were to really drastically 
reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and try to follow a more conservative scenario, so the SSP 1.26, for example, we can recover the sea ice. And I think one of the key things that's important to understand is that the loss of the September sea ice cover is not, even if we start to see these Septembers with no sea ice, we can bring it back. And it is really important then to dramatically reduce our carbon emissions in order to keep some of the sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. But if we do business as usual, there'll be very thin ice and it'll easily melt out. Uh, one of the changes, of course, that will impact how much light reaches the Arctic Ocean because the thinning of the sea ice and the snow on that sea ice play very important roles in under ice algae and phytoplankton blooms, which are both at the base of the marine food web in the Arctic. So while thinning ice may result in more light that can initiate the timing of under ice algae blooms, which is shown in this picture, it will also depend on changes in nutrient availability but it's clear that the phenology of the marine ecosystem will dramatically be altered by these changes in the sea ice environment. Finally, I would like to, of course, mention that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic, and by the sea ice cover, the ocean will now absorb all of the sun's energy that was normally reflected back out to space by the sea ice. And this causes the Arctic to warm up even faster than the rest of the planet. And when you have enhanced warming in the Arctic relative to lower latitudes, this alters the temperature gradient between these two regions, which impacts on our large-scale atmospheric and oceanic circulation patterns. And we already see evidence of slower westerly winds in response to this enhanced warming in the Arctic, which can weaken the jet stream, which would then allow for weather patterns to persist longer, such that extreme heat and drought or cold or intensive rains will get stuck in one place longer. And there has been a clear uptick in extreme weather events over the last couple of decades. And this does appear to be in part linked to this enhanced warming in the Arctic because of the loss of the Arctic sea ice cover.